This is Runehammer. Morgrim's Eye by Brandish Gilhelm. Character Concept by Michael Eichhorn. Few are those who have laid eyes on the great old ones and lived to tell the tale. Rarer still are those able to attune to the forgotten gods, looking into orbs or talismans to actually communicate with chaos itself. Of these, Morgrim Oakenbelly was one of note. Grim as an ocean stone and as aloof as waves at the black door was he, and at his side always that dark-eyed raven, staring and scanning with shrewd intelligence. Let me tell you of what led him to the mouth of the nameless, and how he returned, for it is a tale to inform your nightmares and temper your wizard's ambition." So many dwarven lives are spent in the mines of Iridrum, and too many end there. Here, Morgrim came of age, working the pulleys in the old gold vein shafts, or cutting great blocks dragged down from Pine Henge. Morgrim did his work, made his name, and found his place. The stout folk are not known for wandering feet, and he was content in those days. But peace was not in the skein of his fate, for a darker force had fixed its eye on him. It was a day like a thousand others. Set the ropes, check every harness, set the pulleys, and get each dwarf set to work. Buckle, strap, triple check, clear the below and light the lamps, repeat. By third meal, no less than two hundred of them were at the picks, and the tunnels echoed with clanging labor. Morgrim, you old dog, came the voice of Herod, his foreman. Asleep at the ropes again, I see. <laughs> they took hands in the warrior's grip, smiled, and Morgrim kept his eyes to the men. A fine day for the coffers, Herod, Morgrim replied, still checking and rechecking the rigging. So it is. So much, in fact, I need you at the railway. Surus will take the ropes. Morgrim looked up. That youngster? Are you sure? Aye. He's proved himself plenty, you worrying old nag. Herod smiled wide, placed one blocky hand at Morgrim's shoulder. Now off with you. Let's get these carts the hells out of here. Ah, here's Surus now. The younger dwarf approached, bright-eyed and eager. He nodded to Morgrim, who grunted in return. In most cultures, such a grunt would be a sign of anger, a resent. But these were dwarves, and grumbling was as casual as a grin. At the rail station, Morgrim was dutiful, just as skilled at the ropes and twice the carts rolled upward than on a humdrum shift. He was pleased, had a break, and leaned back for a gulp of gar. Deep below... Another powder blast rumbled, ever deeper. This tremor dusted Morgrim from the ceiling, but the wall by his little work table fissured with unusual ease. He took a closer look. Wall cracks were no small matter this far down. The fissure ran in three directions. This usually meant a cavity lie beyond. The planners would never have missed such a cavern, so what in hells? He reached a square hand forward, picked at the brittle stone, and a half dozen sheets of shale all slid away. Beyond, a dark void yawned. This could be the death of every worker in the damn rails. Before looking any closer, he rang the foreman's bell. It would be a few minutes, but Herod would come running, and then Morgrim saw it. A flickering blue light there in the empty. His curiosity became supernatural, like a, like a bird drawn to some bauble by generations of instinct. He stepped forward into the opening, then into the little space beyond. Fool of a dwarf. Within, the walls of that space formed a perfect spheroid. Freakish, smooth stone almost reflected him in the dim but for the odd central light source, a hovering glass orb. The hairs at his neck stood, but his caution failed him. Forward he crept. Etched in the walls were spirals and blasphemous glyphs. The carvings culminated at the poles of the room, becoming dense with pictorial horrors and tangled knots of prehistory. Morgrim could not breathe. 
He was drawn, pulled, beckoned to the orb. He felt one foolish hand, still gloved, reach out to touch the relic. Now at this moment, all the past and all the future folded inward to a white, hot moment of fate. Morgrim could feel it. The dread and fascination of this place, the foolish curiosity, his tavern mates, and even lovely Miss Frey from the farm stand, they all faded behind him. Ahead in his mind's eye, he could see a life of twisting whips and coiling energy, a sort of glass confusion of visions and foresight and a blinking black eye wreathed in feathers and night. Gods. At that instant, his hand reached the impossible relic, and the glove dissolved from his hand like ash. Their skin met glass, and what seemed like glass was ice cold, was vibrating with some unseen power, and up his arm the hum flowed and into his brain. What Morgrim then saw remains the speculation of history, but how many bards have summoned all their poetic will to lay words to that moment? Lo, he stared time in the eye, and his mind was touched by one of the great old ones, if that be a name of meaning. Who can set words to the timeless, screaming wills of the chaotic gods? Through clouds and galaxies he wheeled and flew, through geysers of blood and whirling dreams of the deep, down and through, across and back he traversed all the universe in an instant, then stood in a silence beyond words, frozen in the endless shadow of a black pyramid obelisk at hell's heart. Here the great old one had brought him, but for some purpose beyond terror. For if madness were the will of the forgotten gods at that moment, then Morgrim would have fallen to the floor a gibbering fool forever. No, that was not why he was here. Some high, dire purpose awaited him. But dwarves are not easily beguiled, least of all by sorcery. And he found the will to speak. What? Who? Uh, what do you want of me? An age passed. After that question, the frozen plain stood death still, that titanic obelisk so massive it sickened him to look up, and eons unfolded before an answer came. With these wordless words came burning the most hellish voice. Like a host of angels on pikes, it howled and gouged at him. But silent and light as a wasp's wings, it flitted across his mind. Yes, he heard his voice respond in a dreamlike echo. But why me? I'm one humble as corn and lost on the arcane. You've need of a wizard, not my stumpy bones. Silence answered. Another century passed, and Morgrim was frozen. Waves of an ebony ocean rose and fell. A nameless citadel was built by invisible hands and crumbled to the scouring wind, all before the reply came. A reply not of words, but of horrors. That obelisk, or pyramid, or was it cubic, It folded inward, transmuted to smoked glass, and Morgrim found himself above it rather than below. His guts wheeled. Then in the shape larger than a sun or even several suns, a writhing, knuckled thing stirred, like a sort of headless serpent or a possessed vine in some haunted wood. It unfurled and sought him, twitching, touching, swelling and dividing in kaleidoscopic madness. Then the obelisk was no larger than the head of a nail, and inches from Morgrim's eyes. He tried to scream, but the sound was a thousand miles below the sea, and the tiny needle spines of that horrid eel found their way into every pore of his eyelids, of his cheek, of his mind. In this he saw his niece die of the fever, his grandfather coughing blood, the graves of all his folk, and the red sun when the forests burned. He saw black feathers and shining wet stones on a bluish tarn. In one hand, great castles rose and fell like toys. 
A wicked, mad laugh gurgled up from his gut. (laughs) And then it was over. Like a cold breath in an icy plunge, it left him. He blinked. The orb, dim now, rested cold and dark in his bare hand. His head ached with dizzy fog. Behind him, just at the edge of his vision, the cavity opening glared bright. Torches. Voices. Time had not caught him yet, for the voices were slow and garbled. The torch flames waved in slow motion. What hell was he trapped in? At this moment, how many poor souls would have collapsed? The terror, the cold, the sickness of it. But Morgrim was an oaken belly. He earned that name, never more than now. When he kept what was left of his wits and when he lurched forward, he earned that name. Let this abomination end, he thought to himself, and so he did, and stumbled forth. Time resumed. His kin helped him to his feet, and a skin of cold golden gar was at his lips. Gods, you fool, Herod asked, lifting him by the elbow. What are you doing in there? A crew of others moved in, bracing the ceiling, seeing nothing unusual, and eventually nodding with diligent precision. The orb, the beyond, Morgren mumbled, shaking off the cold. He was blue as snow and freezing to the touch. God's man, you're like ice, Herod motioned to one more crewman. Get this dwarf to the tavern. A mutton side and full cask of the fire stout, quickly. They took rank, did their duty, and another blur of motion followed. Morgrim had no idea how long it was before he shook the ice from his limbs. He sat, alone, in the oak-timbered pub. It was usually called the Big Drop. A half-empty cask was on his left, and a picked clean mutton chop on his right. Before he could feel anything natural, his right hand rose beside him, like some possessed limb of a dead man. And there in his palm that blasted orb rested. Barkeep, he murmured. She was there next to him. What do I owe? I could use a breeze to clear my blocky brain. Your bill is paid, my lord. Courtesy Herod Greyfist. She curtsied and was lovely, and Morgrim did not notice. To the balustrades of Eredrum he went, and there the high breeze blew clean and cold from Port Frost. The great fields of Norberg were clear and bright below the hills, and his dwarven heart knew a moment of peace. Scanning his home, taking it in, pushing the weird memories away. He spotted a raven aglide on the high wind. It wheeled and soared with effortless wonder. Closer. Then toward him it flew. Closer again, gods it seemed set on him. In a second too short to even flinch, it alighted on the stone ledge before him. Blinking right into his eyes with odd wit. Well, hello, friend, Morgrim joked. What could be strange after what he'd just seen? The great black bird cocked its head, looked directly at the orb, still in Morgrim's numb hand. It bobbed a bit, then locked eyes with him. In terrible paralysis, he looked into that bird's simple soul and saw himself. He saw the great obelisk, the unfolding eels at the center of the universe, an empty skull's laughter with, No! Morgrim barked shaking his eyes free of the vision. It pecked at a pebble, took wing, and vanished. What a day. Set to three days' leave by Herod, Morgrim took to the lower hills for a little rest. He walked among the high pines, and what little snow hid in shadows was good and cool. Miles did he stroll, thinking, wondering, looking into that orb every few moments. It was over. Perhaps just some oddity of the deep caverns, he thought. But on the third day, rather than head back as he was ordered, he turned his feet to the wide world. He felt ashamed and foolish, but there was no denying it. His time in the mines was done. He'd be tried for treason, an outcast now, but he had no care for these things anymore. And as he parted from the era drum, off into the lower lands toward the Khyber, high on the blue wind, a shadow slid. It was the raven, circling him, 
descending, blinking. And through those black ravens' eyes, Morgrim saw all the land laid low, all the ire before him, and his mind was never small again. The great old one would call him, the black feathers would close in, and at the frozen waves would he stand again, and this time he would not be afraid. Thank you for tuning in to this transmission of Runehammer, all things cognitive, creative, and imaginative. This is Brandish Gilhelm signing off. Thank <laughs> you.